We come across a variety of sounds around us in our daily lives. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to Explain how sound is produced. Explain how sound is produced by humans. Demonstrate the need for a medium for the propagation of sound. And explain how we hear sound. That's a very nice piece of music. Your fingers work magic on those strings. But do you know what's really behind the magic of music? When you pluck the stretched string of the guitar, it starts vibrating. It is the vibrating body that produces the sound that we hear. Well, in a guitar, it is the stretched string that vibrates. But what about other instruments? The ones without strings? That's a good question. Musical instruments vibrate when they are beaten or struck. Let us see how sound is produced by some instruments that do not have strings. For example, let's consider a drum. When a drum is hit with a stick, its leather membrane vibrates to produce sound. Similarly, a pair of cymbals, when hit against each other, vibrate and produce sound. But what about a flute? A flute doesn't have a string, leather membrane or any other surface to strike. The sound that we hear when a flute is played is a result of the vibrations in the air column inside it. So, you see, even in a flute, sound is a result of vibrations. In fact, all objects produce sound when they are vibrated. Say, for example, when you strike a metal plate with a spoon, the resulting vibrations produce a sound that we can hear. Hmm, I could see the vibrations of the guitar string. But I can't really see the vibrations of the metal plate. That's true. The vibrations of a body while producing sound may not always be clearly visible to the human eye. Remember the times when you witnessed your brother practicing on the tabla. You couldn't see the vibrations in the membrane of the tabla, could you? No. You're saying that all sounds are produced by vibration? But what about the sound that is produced when we talk? Where is the vibration happening then? To understand that, compare your voice box or the larynx to two small plastic strips. Now, hold them together at both the ends and try to blow air through the gap between them in the middle. Hey, it sounds like a whistle. Can you figure out how this sound is produced? It was the air that you blew between the strips. It made them vibrate. And the vibration produced the whistling sound. This is exactly how your larynx or the voice box produces sound. What's a voice box? Larynx or the voice box is present in the upper portion of the windpipe of your throat. Put your finger on your throat. Can you feel a hard bump? Oh yes, I can, but mom calls it the Adam's apple. You got it. There exists your larynx. If you touch it while talking to me, you can even feel it move. The larynx consists of two vocal cords stretched across. These vocal cords have a narrow slit between them through which air can pass. When air is pushed by the lungs through the slit, 
the vocal cords vibrate producing sound but we can produce so many kinds of sounds we can sing shout whisper whistle how do these vocal cords produce such a variety of sounds you'll be surprised all the sounds human beings make can be achieved by loosening or tightening the cords using muscles attached to these cords the sound produced is louder when the vocal cords are tightened and softer when loosened but there is another interesting thing about how sound produced can differ from person to person listen to these voices hello denise hello denise Hello Denise Have you ever wondered why the voices of men women and children sound different This is because the vocal cords in men are about 20 mm long and in women these are about 15 mm long Children have very short vocal cords So as we grow our vocal cords also grow That's right In fact, when your vocal cords grow, your voice will change. We often refer to this as the breaking of voice in boys. Look out, your voice is probably going to break soon. Hey, let me just answer the phone. So, how did you know that the phone was ringing? Huh? I heard it ring of course. But how did the sound come to you? I don't understand. See? If you could hear the phone ringing in the other room, it shows that the sound traveled to you through air. So sound travels through air? Yes, or any other gaseous medium. Basically, we are able to hear various sounds around us due to the presence of air the medium around us. Okay but then what will happen when there is no air around us you are talking about a vacuum which is lack of any medium let us perform a small activity to find out what happens when sound is produced in a vacuum let's take a glass jar with a wide mouth and put a radio that is switched on into it then We close the mouth with an airtight cork with a hole in it. Next, we insert a pipe through the cork into the jar. Make sure that no air passages between the cork and the pipe. Now, listen carefully. Can you hear the radio play now? Yes. Now, Let's see what happens if the air is sucked out of the jar through the pipe. Can you make out what's happening to the sound? Yes. The sound is getting feebler. Exactly. You can observe that as the air in the jar decreases, the sound also gets feebler. Therefore, clearly, sound cannot travel through a vacuum. How do liquids and solids serve as a medium? Let's first consider liquids. We take a big container and fill it with water. Let's use one of your old toys that plays cymbals. Wind its spring completely and hold it ready to release it. Finally, immerse this toy in the container with water and then release the spring quick put your ear to the surface of the water what do you hear hey i can hear the cymbals this is cool yes you can hear them because sound can travel through liquids as well now let's check solids as a media for sound put your ear to this table Okay. Can you hear anything? Yes. I can hear some scratchy sounds. 
that was me scribbling at this end. You could hear it because sound travels through solids also. In fact, there is another interesting example from day-to-day -day life that demonstrates that sound can travel through solids. Imagine a train traveling towards us. The train may not yet be visible. However, if we put our ears to the track, we can hear the vibrations of the train through the metal on the track. The sound travel with the same speed in all these media? No. Now that you mention it, sound travels the fastest through solids and the slowest through gases. Also, try comparing the speed of sound to light. Which of these do you think travels faster? Hmm, not sure. Light, of course. That's why, during a thunderstorm, you will be able to see the lightning before you hear the thunder. You gave me a lot of information about how sound is produced. But what about hearing? I'm curious. How are our ears able to hear all these sounds? Sure. This discussion would be pointless if we could not hear sound. Watch this experiment with me to give you an idea of how we hear. We take an empty food can and cut it open from both ends. Then we stretch a balloon to cover one end of the can and fasten it with a rubber band. We put a few sand particles on the rubber balloon and place it on a speaker of our music system. We place the food can on the speaker in such a way that the open end is on the speaker. Then we switch the music system on. Hey, the sand particles are dancing. Yes, the sound produced by the speaker makes the rubber membrane vibrate. These vibrations of the membrane make the sand particles dance. Our ear also functions in a similar way. Like the stretched rubber membrane, our ear has a stretched membrane called the eardrum. The sound vibrations around us make the eardrum vibrate. These vibrations are sent to the inner ear by the eardrum. In the inner ear, the vibrations are converted into signals and sent to the brain. The brain interprets these signals to enable us to identify various sounds. Our brain distinguishes between the thousands of sounds around us and tells us exactly what we are hearing. Wow! This brings you to the end of this lesson on production and propagation of sound. Now, you should be able to Explain how sound is produced. Explain how sound is produced by humans. Demonstrate the need for a medium for the propagation of sound. And explain how we hear sound. Waves are longitudinal waves and can travel in solids, liquids and gases. The speed of sound is the highest for solids and the lowest for gases. However, the speed of sound in a given medium is constant. If Vs, Vl and Vg 
denote the speeds of sound in solid, liquid and gases respectively. Then Vs is greater than Vl, greater than Vg. For example, the speed of sound in steel is 5,941 meters per second. In water, it is 1,402 meters per second. And in air, it is 331 meters per second. The table here shows the values for the speed of sound in some other media. Here, it is important to remember that the speed of sound is far less than the speed of light. This is evident from the fact that during a thunderstorm, lightning is seen first and the sound of the thunder is heard later. Let us now study the speed of sound in air in greater detail. We know that sound travels as progressive longitudinal waves in air in the form of compressions and rarefactions. The elasticity and inertia of the medium enable the propagation of sound. If V is the speed of sound in air whose density is rho and pressure is P, then V is equal to under root gamma P by rho, where gamma is the ratio of the specific heat of air at constant pressure Cp to its specific heat at constant volume Cv. Let this be equation 1. The expression for the speed of sound in air is known as the Newton-Laplace formula. In one of the earliest methods to determine the speed of sound in air, a person on the top of a mountain fires a cannon. An observer is stationed on another mountain, some two or three kilometers away from the first. The observer sees the flare of the cannon and starts a stop clock at that instant. The observer stops the stop clock at the instant he hears the sound of the cannon. The stop clock shows the time taken t for the sound to travel the distance d between the two mountains. Knowing the values of d and t, the speed of sound in air can be determined by the relation speed of sound v is equal to distance d by time taken t. The speed of sound determined by this method is about 340 meter per second. However, his method is erroneous since the observer may not start and stop the stop clock at the exact instance coinciding with the corresponding events. A modern method for determining the speed of sound involves the resonance air column apparatus. Before we actually study about the experiment to determine the speed of sound in air using the resonance air column apparatus, let us first. When a body vibrates under the influence of an external periodic force such that their natural frequencies are the same, then the body executes vibrations of increasing amplitude. This is known as resonance. For example, in the arrangement here, pendulum X has the same frequency as that of pendulum C since they are of the same length. Hence, when X is made to vibrate, the resonance air column apparatus consists of a glass jar about 30 cm in diameter and 50 cm in height. This is filled with water to three-fourths of its height. 
there is another glass tube of height about 40 cm and diameter 3 cm which is open at both its ends. This tube is dipped into the water and held at the desired position with the help of a stand. The tube is positioned such that the part of the tube outside the water contains air which can vibrate when excited with the help of a tuning fork. And we can hear a sound due to the vibration when the tuning fork is excited with the help of a rubber hammer and held near the open end of the tube, the sound waves, which are longitudinal waves in air, propagate through the air column in the tube and reflect from the wall. Now, the reflected waves superpose with the forward moving waves. Thus, stationary longitudinal waves are formed along the air column with nodes at the closed end and the distance between a node and the immediate antinode is equal to lambda by 4 where lambda is the wavelength of the sound wave. The length of the air column L is the distance between the open end of the tube and the water level in it. With the vibrating tuning fork of known frequency nu held at the open end of the tube. The tube is raised in steps of millimeter. When the booming sound is heard, the length of the air column in the tube is noted as L1 and it is called the first resonating length. This booming sound is due to resonance between the two frequencies, that of the tuning fork and the air column. When resonance occurs, the frequency of the tuning fork is equal to the frequency of the resonating air column. In the figure, the air column vibrates with a node at the closed end and an antinode at the open end such that L1 is equal to the distance between the node and the antinode, which is lambda by 4. Let this be equation 2. The vibrating tuning fork is held near the open of the tube again and the tube is further raised in steps of millimeter until a second booming sound is heard corresponding to resonance. The length of the air column is now noted as L2. Now the stationary wave formation in the air column is such that it vibrates with two nodes and two antinodes. There is an antinode at the open end and a node at the closed end. Now, we see that the length of the air column L2 is equal to 3 lambda by 4. Let this be equation 3. Then, L2 minus L1 is equal to 3 lambda by 4 minus lambda by 4, which is equal to lambda by 2. Or, we can write lambda is equal to 2 L2 minus L1. Let this be equation 4. Now, the speed of sound in air, V, is equal to nu lambda. Let this be equation 5. Substituting the value of lambda, we get V is equal to nu into 2 L2 minus L1. On simplifying, we get speed of sound V in air is equal to 2 nu into L2 minus L1. Let this be equation 6. Thus, by knowing the values of nu, L1 and L2, we can calculate the speed of sound in air. Here it is important to note that the position of an antinode will be actually a little above the open end of the tube. Hence, a correction, known as end correction, E, is also taken into consideration. It is added to L1 as well as L2. However, when L2 minus L1 is considered, it gets cancelled and the formula for V as given by equation 6 is obtained again. Let us now look at the atmospheric factors 
that affect the speed of sound in air. First, let us study the effect of wind on the speed of sound in air. If wind blows in the direction of propagation of sound, then the effective speed of sound in air is equal to the sum of the speed of sound Vs and the speed of wind Vw. If wind blows in the direction opposite to that of propagation of sound, then the effective speed of sound is equal to the difference between the speed of sound Vs and the speed of wind Vw. If wind blows at an angle with the direction of propagation of sound, then the effective speed of sound is calculated by taking the component of the speed of wind Vw cos theta in the direction of propagation of sound. Now let us see how temperature affects the speed of sound in air. The speed of sound in air is directly proportional to the square root of the absolute temperature of air. The speed of sound in air increases by about 0.6 meter per second for every 1 degree rise in temperature. Let us now study the effect of humidity on the speed of sound in air. The density of water vapor is less than the density of dry air for the same pressure. Therefore, the density of moist air is less than the density of dry air for the same pressure. From equation 1 for speed of sound V in air, we see that V is inversely proportional to density of air rho for the same pressure. As the density of moist air is less than that of dry air, the speed of sound in moist air is greater than the speed of sound in dry air for the same pressure. This implies that as humidity increases, the speed of sound in air increases. The speed of sound in air is independent of pressure. Since the ratio of pressure P to density rho of air is always constant for a given temperature, according to Boyle's law. According to Boyle's law, the pressure P of a gas is directly proportional to the density rho of the gas at constant temperature, and as such, the ratio of P to rho is a constant at a constant temperature. Hello. 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 As you can see, if you speak loudly in mountainous areas, it seems like the mountains are responding right back. We commonly call this response an echo. Let's consider another example. Golconda, a ruined fort in South Central India, is situated west of Hyderabad. One of the famous engineering marvels at Golconda is the fantastic acoustic effects used to maintain security in the fort. A hand clap at a certain point below the dome at the entrance of the fort can be heard clearly at the highest point in the fort, located almost a kilometer away. This hand clap worked as a warning note to the Royals residing in the fort in case of an attack. Why do we hear echoes? Well, like light, sound also reflects off objects. Reflection of sounds lead to such phenomena as echoes. In this lesson, you will learn about the reflection of sound. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to define reflection of sound.
Verify laws of reflection of sound. Explain the concept of an echo. Calculate the minimum distance required to hear an echo. List the applications of multiple reflection. Define reverberation. Explain the structure of the human ear. Define the ranges of hearing. For infrasonic sound, audible sound and ultrasonic sound. List the applications of ultrasound and define sonar. Look at this ball. When it is thrown on a hard surface, it bounces back. Light as well as sound waves behave in a similar manner. When light rays are incident on a reflecting surface, they bounce back. Similarly, a sound wave incident on a hard surface bounces back into the same medium. This is known as the reflection of sound. According to the laws of reflection of sound, the direction in which the sound wave is incident and the direction in which it is reflected make equal angles with the normal to the reflecting surface at the point of incidence. The incident sound wave, the reflected wave and the normal at the point of incidence are in the same plane. Sound waves need polished or rough surfaced obstacles to get reflected. Let's verify these laws through an experiment. To set up the experiment, we take two identical hollow pipes, PQ and RS, each about two feet long. We place these pipes on the surface of a table near a wall so that their axis intersect at point O on the wall as shown. Then, we keep a clock near the end P of the pipe. Finally, keep a cardboard vertically in between the pipes so that the sound of the clock at P cannot be heard directly at the end S of the pipe RS. Now we try to hear the sound of the clock from the end S of the pipe RS. The angle of the pipe RS can be changed by tilting it in a horizontal plane about the point O. The sound is very feeble, isn't it? That's a little better. Wow, that's quite clear, right? Oh ho, this angle is not so good. The sound has become feeble again. A feeble ticking sound can be heard through the pipe RS in random positions. Fix the position of the pipe RS at the angle where the loudness of the sound heard is maximum. Let's now measure the angle between the axis of the pipe PQ and the normal to the wall at the point O. This is the angle of incidence I for the incident sound wave. Now, we'll measure the angle between the axis of the pipe, RS, and the normal to the wall at the point O. This is the angle of reflection, R, for the reflected sound wave. You can see that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Now, try changing the orientation of the pipe, RS, by tilting it vertically. The audibility, that is, the loudness of the reflected sound, decreases. This is because, when tilted vertically, the plane of the reflected sound wave is different from the plane of the incident sound wave. In this situation, only parts of the reflected sound wave pass through the pipe RS. This confirms that the incident wave, the reflected wave, and the normal all lie in the same plane. We already saw what happens when you shout in an open air in the mountains. 
Let's now observe this boy shouting into a well. This is an experiment. Did you hear that? That was the boy's voice reflected back from the water in the well. In our daily lives, we call this sort of a reflection an echo. Thus, an echo is repetition of sound that results as a reflection from a surface. Here's an interesting fact about the origin of the word echo. According to Greek mythology, Echo was a nymph who had the job of talking incessantly to Hera, the queen of gods, so that her husband Zeus would not get caught in his misdeeds. Hera caught on to Echo's tricks and cursed her to only be able to say what others had just said. Thus, reflection of sound can be attributed to Echo talking under the curse, repeating what you say. Hello! You may be wondering why you don't hear an echo for reflection of every sound. To explain this, let's observe a scenario where a man standing in front of a cliff shouts, Hello! 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 Hello. Did you hear that? There was a clear echo. Now, let's see what happens if the man moves closer to the cliff and shouts, Hello again! Hello! In this case, there was no echo when the man shouted. Why do you think you could hear an echo in the first position but not in the second? Try and analyze what changed in the second situation. Nothing but the distance of the man from the cliff, right? It is the distance that is making a difference. We cannot hear an echo unless the reflecting surface is beyond a specified distance from the source of the sound. In this case, it was the man shouting hello. To find out how this works, let's examine how our brain processes sound. The sensation of sound persists in our brain for 0.1 second. Therefore, to identify an echo, the time interval between the reception of the original sound and the reflected sounds should be at least 0.1 second. So, how much distance do we need between the source of a sound and the reflecting surface to be sure that we will be able to hear an echo? Let's find out. The speed of sound at a given temperature, say 22 degrees Celsius, is 344 meters per second. Consider the echo produced by shouting on a cliff. Let D be the distance between the source of sound. In this case, the man and the obstacle. In this case, the cliff. The distance traveled by the sound wave from the source to the obstacle and back to the source is equal to 2D. To hear the echo, the duration in which the reflected sound travels back should be at least 0.1 second. Therefore, by using the expression of speed, the distance traveled by the sound wave is equal to the product of the speed of the sound and the time for which a sound persists in our brain. On substituting the values, and simplifying, we get the distance is equal to 17.2 meters. Therefore, the minimum distance required to hear an echo is 17.2 meters. Note, this distance will change with the temperature of air, as the speed of sound changes with the temperature of air. When you hear thunder rolling, the sound continues for some time. The rolling of thunder is due to the successive reflections of sound from a number of reflecting surfaces, such as the clouds and land. This is called multiple reflection of sound. Thus, multiple reflection of sound is the successive reflection of sound from various reflecting surfaces. 
we find many useful applications of multiple reflections of sound in our daily life. A doctor using a stethoscope to give you a checkup is a very common sight. A stethoscope uses the principle of multi-reflections to help the doctor hear your heartbeat. Let's take a look at how it works. The chest piece of the stethoscope consists of a plastic disc called the diaphragm, which is placed on the patient's body. The sound of the heartbeat vibrates the disc. These vibrations produce pressure waves which travel to the listener's ears through the hollow tubes by a series of multiple reflections throughout the tubes. There are various other applications of multiple reflections. Megaphones, horns and musical instruments like trumpets are designed to magnify amplitude of the sound and reflect and propagate sound waves in a particular direction. The curved ceilings of cinema halls and conference halls are also designed keeping the principles of multiple reflections in mind. The curve in the ceiling ensures that the sound is reflected to all the corners of the hall so that there is an even distribution of sound. In some cases, a sound board is positioned behind the stage so that the sound waves produced are spread across the hall evenly. However, in cases where these halls are not designed properly, multiple reflections can lead to uneven distribution of sound. Let's see what causes this problem. Consider a big closed room where a source S, a speaker and an observer O are in the positions as shown. The observer may hear more than one reflection of sound produced by the source. This is due to the multiple reflections produced at different locations on the walls and in the room. This can make it difficult for the observer to focus on what the speaker is saying and hear him clearly. The reflected sound is heard until its intensity is reduced to a value where it is no longer audible. Finally, the sound fades off completely. Thus, the observer hears the sound produced by the source persistently till it fades away beyond audibility. This phenomenon of persistence of sound in a closed enclosure, due to the multiple reflections of sound in an enclosure, is called reverberation. Reverberation is generally minimized in auditoriums by covering the walls, the ceiling and the flooring using sound absorbent material like cardboard, thick curtains and fiber. Sound as a concept would not exist for us if we could not hear it, right? Therefore, an explanation of the reflection of sound is incomplete without a look at the mechanism that enables us to hear. The human ear. The ear converts audible sound waves in air into electric impulses that reach the brain, enabling us to hear. Here, you can see the structure of the human ear. The human ear is categorized into three main parts. The outer ear, middle ear and the inner ear. Let's see how these parts work together to produce the sensation of hearing. The outer ear, called the pinna, allows sound waves to pass into the ear through the auditory canal. At the end of this canal is the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. When a compression or rarefaction reaches the eardrum, it pushes or pulls the eardrum inward or outward respectively due to the pressure on the outer side of the membrane. The middle ear is comprised of three bones, the hammer, anvil and the stirrup. These bones amplify the vibration and transmit the pressure variations of the sound waves to the inner ear. The inner ear is comprised of various parts, including the cochlea and an auditory nerve. The cochlea converts the pressure variations into electrical signals. Then, 
These signals are transmitted to the brain through the auditory nerve. These electrical signals are interpreted by the brain as the appropriate kind of sound. Hearing aids help us compensate for any shortcomings in our hearing capabilities. So, how does a hearing aid work? A hearing aid is a battery operated device that receives sound waves through a microphone. This microphone converts sound waves into electrical signals which are amplified by an amplifier. The amplified signals are sent to the speaker of the hearing aid. The speaker converts them into sound waves and sends them into the ear at a volume that the ear can clearly hear. The buzzing of a bee is clearly audible. In fact, sometimes we wish it wasn't so loud. However, though we can see the pendulum vibrating, it doesn't seem to be producing a sound. Look at the boy straining to hear the sound of the pendulum. We are unable to hear some of the sounds produced around us because sounds vary in their frequencies. A human ear can only hear sounds that are within a frequency of 20 Hz to 20,000 Hz. This range of frequency is called the audible range. We cannot hear sounds with a frequency lesser or greater than this audible range. However, the audible range for different species is different. Dogs, for example, have an audible range much higher than that of humans. That's why people have watchdogs. Dogs can hear many sounds that are not audible to human ear. The table shows the hearing range for three animals. Dogs can hear sound waves ranging from 18 kilohertz to 22 kilohertz. Rhinoceros can hear sound waves ranging from 0 hertz to 5 hertz. Bats can hear sound waves ranging from 0 hertz to 100 kilohertz. Sound waves that have a frequency less than 20 hertz are called infrasonic sound waves. These are also referred to as infrasound waves or infrasonics. Similarly, sound waves that have a frequency greater than 20,000 Hz are called ultrasonic sound waves. These are also referred to as ultrasounds or ultrasonics. A summary of the various ranges of sounds is shown here. What does the word ultrasound remind you of? Yes, it commonly refers an ultrasound scan that helps check on the health of a baby in a womb. Ultrasound scanners enable us to obtain images of internal organs of the human body. Even though we cannot hear them with our naked ears, ultrasonic sound waves have a wide range of applications in several fields such as medicine and industry. For example, ultrasounds are used in a technique called echocardiography. This technique is used to diagnose any defects in the heart by obtaining the image of the heart. Ultrasonic waves are made to reflect from various parts of the heart and the reflected waves form the image of the heart. Ultrasounds are also used for medical treatment. For example, it is used to help people suffering from kidney stones. Ultrasound waves are used to break the stones into fine grains so that they can be released from the body through the excretory system. In industrial applications, ultrasounds are generally used to clean parts located in hard-to-reach places. For example, in spiral tubes, odd-shaped parts and electronic components. Here's how the cleaning is done. The relevant object is put in a cleaning solution and these sound waves are sent into that solution. Due to the high frequency of the waves, the dust and dirt particles detach from the object, leaving it clean and dust free. Ultrasounds can also be used to detect cracks and defects in metal blocks. Cracks 
or air bubbles present inside a metal block are invisible from the outside. To detect these cracks, ultrasonic waves are passed through the metal block. And detectors are placed on the other side of the block to detect the transmitted waves. On encountering a crack or an air bubble, the ultrasound gets reflected back, indicating the presence of the defect. Sonar stands for Sound, Navigation and Ranging. Sonar is a device that uses ultrasonic waves to measure the distance, direction and speed of underwater objects or the depth of seabeds. It consists of a transmitter and a detector fitted at the bottom of a ship. Let's see how it works. The transmitter produces and transmits ultrasonic waves that travel through water and reflect back after striking objects or the seabed. The detector catches the reflected rays and converts the ultrasonic waves into electrical signals which can be suitably interpreted. The distance of the object that reflected the sound wave is calculated using the speed of sound in water and the time interval between emission and reception of the ultrasound. This technique is useful in determining the depth of the sea and to locate underwater hills, valleys, submarines, icebergs and sunken ships. Let's consider an example where we use this technique to determine the depth of the sea. Let the distance from the ship to the seabed be D. The sound wave sent to the seabed has to travel twice the distance from the ship to the seabed, that is, from the transmitter to the seabed and back to the receiver. Twice the distance D is equal to the product of the speed of the sound wave in water, V and the time interval between emission and reception of the ultrasound. Thus, the depth of the seabed is equal to half the product of speed of the sound and the time interval. Here is an example of a species that uses its personal sonar to obtain its food. A bat emits high-pitched ultrasonic squeaks that hit the obstacle or the prey and reflect back to the bat's ears. Based on the reflections received, the bat is able to determine the nature and location of its prey. This brings you to the end of this lesson on reflection of sound. In this lesson, you learned how reflection of sound results in echoes and reverberation. You also learned about applications of reflection of sound and the working of the human ear. The section on solved problems provides you an opportunity to review some model problems based on these concepts. To revisit the key points covered in this lesson, please review the flashcard.